Good afternoon. My name is Council Member Antonio Reynoso and I am the Chair of the Council Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee. Today we will be hearing three bills aimed at removing sham unions from private carting industry, educating workers on their rights to organize, and codifying the steps the city must take when they suspect the wage theft is occurring at a private carting company. As you have heard me state many times before from this chair, the private sanitation industry operates without regard for the health and safety of its workers or city at large. And I want to I want to re I want to restate that uh, for the record. Some in the sanitation industry operate without regard for the health and safety of its workers um, and the city at large. In these cases, routes are inefficient, safety standards are poor, and environmentally uh, environmentally unsustainable practice uh, in these companies. However, it is the treatment of workers, many of whom are immigrants or formerly incarcerated individuals, some of the most vulnerable members of our society that I found most tragic. But I want to be clear, it is not only the companies themselves that are complicit in this disgraceful behavior, it is many of these shops in it is the very unions that are supposed to represent and protect workers who are aiding and abetting their mistreatment. It is important for me to clarify exactly what type of union we're talking about here. We are not talking about unions like the Teamsters, DC 37, or 1199, organizations that have a long history of fighting for their members and delivering meaningful benefits to workers. We have unwavering support for these organizations in the city. Make no mistake, New York has and always will be a union town. What we are talking about today are sham unions, organizations that are in collusion with the company's ownership to prevent legitimate unions from organizing workers and ensure these workers never receive meaningful benefits and protections from their employers. Sham unions have also been used as a vehicle for organized crime to retain a foothold within the carding industry. As many of you are aware, this industry was run by organized crime for decades. Following the creation of BIC in the 1990s, much of the organized crime was rooted out of the industry. However, BIC's oversight authority only extends to, companies, to the companies themselves, not the officers of these sham unions. This big gap in BIC's oversight authority has allowed organized crime to continue working within the carding industry. One of my pieces of legislation, intro 1329, will expand BIC's authority, giving them the necessary tools to investigate union officers within the commercial waste industry. Intro 1368, sponsored by Councilmember Francisco Moya, would require BIC to post information regarding workers' rights on their website and distribute this information directly to employees of companies it regulates. We are also aware of the wage theft that is, serious, that is a serious issue in this industry. A recent example being the workers of sanitation salvage in the Bronx who are still owed hundreds of thousands of dollars in back wages. While I, I expect BIC to already be referring cases to the relevant enforcement agencies where it suspects wrongdoing that falls outside of its jurisdiction, the final bill we are hearing today, intro 1373, will codify this law into activity, or this activity into law. Today, you are going to hear from workers who have been impacted by this corrupt system of sham unions and worker exploitation, how they haven't been paid, how they work in some of the most dangerous and miserable conditions imaginable. How even when they are paid, their wages hardly compensate for the back-breaking work that they're doing. How the unions that are supposed to stick up for them turn around and collude with management behind their back. I want everyone in this chamber to ask themselves how we as a city can continue to tolerate a business that behaves in this way in 2019. The time for reform is now. I want to thank the Teamsters for bringing the existence of sham unions to my attention. And of course, Kira Feldman from ProPublica for her reporting on the connections these unions have to organized crimes. I also want to thank the Transform with No Trash Coalition for their continued efforts in the fight for reform. And finally, I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his unwavering commitment to ensuring that the status quo in the private carding industry becomes a thing of the past. With that, we're going to um, ask the administration to speak, ask Bick to speak, but first come, can you raise your right hand to be sworn in? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. So, uh, Commissioner Don Brunel and Noah Gunnell, uh, please, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Reynoso and Council Member Espinal. 
Thank you for uh, inviting us to testify at today's hearing. <clears throat> As this committee knows well, the commercial trade waste hauling industry can be dangerous for both its workers and the public on our city streets. Drivers and helpers in this industry have some of the most physically demanding jobs of any industry. They work long, at times excessive hours. They carry heavy loads, and in too many companies, worker safety takes a back seat to making money. If ever there was a need for a strong, fair union representation for workers, it is in this industry. The Business Integrity Commission, originally named the Trade Waste Commission, was created by local law in 1996 to rid the trade waste hauling industry of the grip of organized crime and various forms of corruption. Trade waste, for those who are new to the term, is essentially commercial garbage or waste. Soon after BIC was created, it was also given jurisdiction over New York City's public wholesale markets. For the past 23 years, BIC has fought with significant success against organized crime and other criminality in the industries it regulates. Over the last four years, BIC has prioritized taking action related to safety in the trade waste industry. Our experience demonstrates that trade waste worker safety is closely related to safety for the public as a whole. Therefore, the, bill at issue at today, the bills at issue at today's hearing are extremely important to everyone's well-being in this city. At BIC, we strive within our current powers to improve safety in the industry. Since 2016, BIC has been a member of the Vision Zero Task Force, which is part of the Mayor's Vision Zero initiative to end traffic deaths and injuries in New York City. Vision Zero is founded on the assertion that every death or serious injury involving a motor vehicle in the city is one too many. The focus is on protecting the life of everyone who lives in, works in, and visits our city. BIC has worked on a number of initiatives as part of the Vision Zero Task Force, including creating a universal tradeway safety manual developed in collaboration with the industry. The safety manual is available in English and Spanish and has been distributed throughout the industry. Some trade waste companies are using the manual as a basis to develop and improve their own safety plans, which we strongly encourage all safe trade waste companies to do. Unfortunately, not all trade waste companies have safety in mind. One such example, as already stated today, is Sanitation Salvage, whose trade waste license we suspended for a period of time over the summer when we found that the company posed an imminent danger to the safety of everyone in the city, requiring drivers and helpers to work excessive hours or risk losing their jobs is a recipe for disaster. Worker abuse usually goes hand in hand with larger safety problems at a company and is one reason that strong unions working tirelessly for their members' rights are so important in this industry. And it also shows why unions that do not have the best interests of their members in mind, but rather are allied with management, can be so dangerous. Excessive work hours for drivers and helpers create a safety hazard, not just for the workers, but for everyone walking, driving, or cycling in the city. BIC has seen too many instances where these workers are required to work 13, 15, sometimes as many as 20 hours in a single shift, often working those shifts six days a week. Companies operating in this fashion supply refuse to expand, in this simply refuse to extend, expend the money necessary to purchase sufficient trucks and hire enough drivers and helpers to cover all of their company pickups within a reasonable amount of time. So they cut the cost for themselves, place the unfair burden on their workers, and put everyone in danger. Amazingly, many of these companies are union shops, which begs the question, whose interests are they truly representing? BIC regularly works with locals 813 and 108, which represent many of the workers in this industry. Through these locals and other means, we have spoken with dozens of workers in the industry to hear their complaints about work conditions. Given the difficult conditions, unions are essential to help protect the workers. Yet there are some unions purporting to represent the workers in this industry 
when they clearly, as we've said, are aligned with management instead. Such unions have been commonly characterized as sham unions, and they are a major problem in this industry. Whether represented by a union or not, trade waste workers need to know their rights. We support the overall concept of Intro 1386 by Councilmember Moya regarding informing workers of their rights, including filing complaints with BIC. Of course, when we receive such complaints, we follow up on them, and we are committed to continuing to do so. We look forward to working with the Council and the unions to make this happen. We will also work with the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, which already publishes a great amount of information regarding workers' rights. We also support the overall concept of thir Intro 1373 by Chair Reynoso. Workers' allegations that their unions are working for the benefit of management and not the workers raise serious concerns about corruption in the unions in the form of sweetheart deals and kickbacks sacrificing the safety and well-being of their membership. Where we see these issues, we work with the agencies that investigate these types of offenses. It is important that we maintain the discretion as to when, where, and how we refer the complaints. This will avoid duplicative investigations, which is a waste of t limited resources and could actually harm the investigation. But, we sh but you should know <clears throat> that where we have credible allegations of violations of workers' rights, we do and will continue to work with the proper agencies to investigate the claims and take any appropriate action. Intro 1329 will provide important tools for BIC in protecting workers in the trade waste industry. Currently, the Administrative Code does not give BIC any explicit authority to regulate unions in the trade waste industry. This limits the amount of information we have regarding which unions are operating in the industry and perhaps more importantly, who their officials are. This circumstance has hampered BIC's ability to identify corrupt actors in the unions. With Intro 1329, BIC will be able to require that unions register with the Commission and disclose, among other things, the names of all officer and agents of the union. This allows us to do full background checks of the union officials. <clears throat> Under Intro 1329, each officer of a union will be required to disclose, among other things, all criminal convictions, any pending civil and criminal actions to which the officer is a party, and any criminal or civil investigation that the officer has been the subject of or was subpoenaed in connection with. The commission, the commission may disqualify an officer of a labor union from holding office in certain circumstances, such as if the officer provides false information to the commission, has been convicted of a racketeering activity or associated with a person who has been convicted of racketeering activity or is associated with any member or associate of organized crime. We know this system works because we already register unions in the public wholesale markets. And Intro 1329 is modeled on the language in the administrative code that authorizes BIC to do so. This is not a cure-all, and it does not give BIC the power to oust a particular union from representing workers in the trade waste industry. But, we're, but by requiring the union officials to submit to our background check, we will learn a great deal about who runs the union and can disqualify officials who should not be involved in this heavily regulated industry. Unions that are free from corruption are critical to the trade waste industry. Instead of being beholden to management or organized crime's influence, corruption-free unions can negotiate a fair wages, safe working conditions, and medical benefits for their members. Everyone benefits from that. We look forward to working with you on intros 1329, 1368, and 1373. We also look forward to working with you on the legislation that BIC has developed to expand BIC's jurisdiction in the area of safety in the trade waste industry and on legislation regulating commercial waste zones. We will now gladly answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Commissioner. We've also been joined by Council Members Espinal and Council Member Councilmember Vallone, thank you for being here. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that testimony, and it, it seems that um, there's a, a, a good level of support from the administration 
um, over these bills. I guess um, a lot of them you answered in your testimony, a lot of these questions, so I'm just gonna go over them in more detail, I guess, uh, so we can get a clearer answer. Um, just in general, does BIC currently have the ability to take on regulation of these unions? Like, what authority do, does BIC have at this moment um, of the unions that we're talking about that we don't think represent their workers? And what we have the authority to do would be if we make a finding against someone in a particular union, um, it's difficult to do, it's a laborious process, and quite frankly, one of the problems that we've had in the investigations that we currently have, and we're not doing them alone, we're doing them mostly with, with federal labor-related law enforcement agencies, is knowing exactly who the officers and agents are in a particular union, and that's been very frustrating, and this bill goes directly towards addressing that. So right now, you would need to either get a tip or someone would have to tell you about something that's happening. Um, if this law was to pass, you would be able to be a more proactive about trying to figure these things out. Yeah, one of the things that we did a little over a year ago, and I wish, we'd, I wish I'd started it sooner, is to develop a better relationship with locals 813 and 108 who have provided us with lots of information about all of these issues. Not just, of course, unions, but also you know various circumstances with workers in the industry, and um, both those unions have been very helpful to us in our investigations. That's good. We, well, we, we appreciate that, and we just want to make sure that the work that's being done doesn't solely rely on that relationship, so I'm excited no. that we could extend. No, we also get lots of information from the other um, labor-related law enforcement agencies. It, obviously, they don't just cover the trade waste industry, but they cover a number of industries. So for, to, to use it as an example, especially related to intro 1373, uh, just a general question. Has BIC ever found evidence of labor violations or wage theft? We, we haven't. We, we've referred wage theft, and it's part of, we've got, and I don't want to name the unions we're looking into, but we currently have two fairly large investigations right now, not only with... Um, federal labor law enforcement agencies, but also with federal prosecutors. Um, and so we're working on those particular cases and there's more than just those issues. So uh, given that you might not have the authority, let's say, to, to do some of this work, what you tend to do is always find the relative agency that would be in charge of doing an investigation and so forth and making sure that you're working alongside them to, to follow through on a lot of these. Right, but I just want to make it clear that we don't just refer them. We actually do the investigations with them. I mean, first of all, generally, um, because we oversee this agent, this industry as a whole, we're going to have the best ability to contact workers. So, for instance, um, you know, one of the big problems in this industry that we found in the last couple of years is off-the-books workers. Um, you know, clearly they're not getting paid appropriately. In fact, in some cases, they don't even make minimum wage. Um, but there are much larger issues, such as safety. I mean, the, the, the crash uh, a year ago in November with the sanitation salvage truck with the young man that was an off-the-books worker clearly had never been trained. And, you know, as a direct result of that, ended up getting run over and killed by the truck. I mean, that's an extreme example, but it's a very real example of what happens in this industry with off-the-books workers. And we, we, I don't have statistics for you, but I think that it's unfortunately an all-too-common practice, especially by companies that are looking to you know, cut expenses at the expense of their workers. So speaking of sanitation salvage, um, I have, I guess I wanna ask like two questions because um, so they can all get asked is, um, have you found any cases in which sanitation salvage was involved in wage theft? And specifically, what have you done with any evidence if that is the case? And um, were they referred to any other law agents? Just in general, for folks to get a better understanding of what's happening with sanitation salvage. And just from my take, what, we're under what we understand is that they're trying to relieve themselves of any responsibility over the lack of pay, um, sick days and vacation days of their workers um, at sanitation salvers, so they're trying to just uh, just wipe them off the books. Uh, so that's a current investigation we're doing, and so I don't want to say too much. The only thing I would say, and we've already spoken to many, many workers in this industry, some of whom I recognize in the galley, but if there are people that have additional information, 
um, you should contact us directly at 212, what is it, 437-0500, and I know through both 813 and the other unions, um, the more people that we get to come forward and provide us with information, the better. So I, I won't go deeper if it's under investigation. I don't want to put you in a position where you either can't say something or, or, or say too much. <laughs> um, what about safety violations? So outside of worker uh, pay or wage theft, uh, when there's a worker safety issue, how does BIC respond to that and what authority does BIC have related to safety? Well, we'd like to get more and as the chairman knows there's a bill that's, that's um, hopefully will be pending soon. But, you know, and, and we're not the first to say this, quite frankly, I think Sean Campbell was the first to say this with regard to work hours. But one of the things I can say about the sanitation salvage investigation, at least as it goes up to this point, and I can say it because it's part of the public record of the hearing that was held in late August, um, and, it's, and the full um, decision of the commission is on our website, is that we found over a couple, only over a few months, I think it was a three month period, literally hundreds of examples of um, drivers being forced to work um, shifts that were in violation of the federal motor carrier rules. And those rules, I think, are, you know, allowed too many hours. Those rules are really more geared towards, you know, long haul tractor trailer mm -hmm. drivers, which right. is a very different kind of work than, you know, running a garbage truck where you're getting in and out, where you're lifting things. And so that is certainly one of the things, and I really want to work with, with this committee and with the law department to figure out a way, and I don't want to wait until waste zone collection, right. which will make it easier to do that kind of, you know, compel those kinds of safety protocols. But we, if we could, as just one thing, cut down the hours that drivers and helpers are forced to work to reasonable hours, that would go a long way to creating more safety in this industry. And I'm not saying that's where we would stop, but that to me is critical. Can, so what about workers' rights? So uh, a big problem that we're having, um, I remember two employees from a five-star five star, right. were here, they testified. Right, in, in Life 890. They got fired. Right, for coming forward. On Monday, so we had to go to yeah. a rally on Monday. Uh, to fight for their jobs back. They got their jobs back. Um, and, you know, the way these companies work, we're given certain perks and, and short-term rewards to come back and stay quiet. Yeah, almost like a payoff. Uh, like a payoff, right? Uh, but what they didn't know were their rights. Uh, right. And even though they were informed by unions that know what they're doing, of what their rights are that they're allowed to testify related to um, issues that they're having in their company without the fear of, of expulsion. Right. Um, what, what role do you play, does the BIC play in relation to educating and informing workers of their rights related to, to I guess, to, to, to unionizing? Well, just sort of anecdotally, you know, when we started talking with workers um, in the last year or so, it was amazing to me the misinformation that is told to workers by some of these other unions and by the owners of companies. And it is just amazing how they don't really know what to do. And that's why, I, um, you know, I, I think um, Council Members Moya's bill, and we're gonna work with DCA already does, I know it's not called DCA anymore, but they already do a lot of this stuff. I know with Locals 813 and 108, we'll put together a comprehensive bill of rights and then mandate that every company post those, you know, almost like the safety things that they have to do for OSHA in very conspicuous places in their company so that workers can see exactly what their rights are and, of course, have our number um, to call if they have something to report. So at times I'm often critical of our, your, the safety symposiums that are put together that BIG participates in, but um, just want to talk about how the, the symposium itself, um, have there been conversations about like these Bill of Rights and, and how these companies should be using them? Uh, has there been a, a, a actual effort um, to look at safety and, and maybe posting these rights be something that was encouraged before this law, let's say, was You even know, I don't, to be perfectly honest, I don't remember it coming up at a symposium. It certainly will now. 
um, and it will, you know, the, and the symposiums, there's nothing about the symposiums that are mandatory. We don't have the authority to do that. Quite frankly, we don't reach enough companies. We reach the larger companies. Um, companies that we have concerns about, we never see. Never see the owners, we never see the workers. That doesn't work. You know, even with the, the safety manual, that's all voluntary. And, it, and, I, and I noticed in the testimony, it wasn't just BIC and in the, in the industry that worked on that, but it was also everyone else involved from the advocates and other people to put together, you know, a pretty comprehensive, concise manual. But, you know, that's the kind of thing, and, and, and hopefully this, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, this safety bill gets through, but that's one of the things that we can mandate, that every company provide to us their written safety plan based on the manual as a guide. At least that assures that companies are thinking about safety. Many of the larger companies, well, I shouldn't say just the larger companies, many of the companies do, but it's clear to me that there are far too many that don't. So should we pass the- Councilman, yeah, go ahead. May, may I just also mention that of the five safety symposiums that um, there have been plus one workshop, uh, which was a train the trainers event that just happened a couple of weeks ago regarding the safety manual, in one way or another, worker safety has been discussed at every one of those. It's not necessarily talking about the Bill of Rights, but um, driving on the city streets and various um, forms of safety equipment and other equipment for the vehicles. So that is something that has been discussed at every one of the safety symposia. And just one other thing about the Bill of Rights, um, the commissioner said, uh, talked about um, requiring that it be posted at every company. We'll, of course, do whatever we can within the bounds of the law. There may, we have to take a look at what we can require with respect to posting things, but we certainly will look at it. My goal has always been that if we're gonna have a safety symposium, that we, we figure out a way to make recommendations that come from that mandatory, right? Like that would be the ideal, the ideal setup. Um, till we get there or till we can get right. there, um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't have them. So, so I understand that and I respect that. So yeah. I really think that this uh, Bill of Rights, a conversation that we have here, uh, kind of speaks to wanting to do that, right. making their recommendations more permanent. Right, and one of the big things is equipment in the industry. So, I mean, for one thing, you know, minimal um, rear mirrors. I mean, that's easy, it's not that expensive, but, you know, as, as I'm learning slowly, because obviously I don't run a garbage company, the cost of cameras has, and, and the improvement in the technology and the, and the lowering of price, I think for one thing, as there are more you know, companies competing, that's actually now a possibility of something that we would require in the industry. And from what I can tell, in, in, and, and Noah has sort of run this in terms of dissecting various crashes with the NYPD and TLC and other people, is that the biggest problem is that drivers don't see. And cameras, of course, go a long way in, in allowing a driver to essentially see all the way around a truck. A, a big part of a concern of mine always when it comes to the, the work that we're doing related to reform or any changes that we're making is that uh, a lot of the mistakes or, or the mishaps that have been in this industry by the drivers comes from the fact that they're being overworked they're working the hours, they're working late shifts, it's cold, their equipment is shoddy, right. if they even have it. Uh, their trucks are old in some cases. Some of them are not even being provided with basic safety equipment like gloves, boots, or, or, or uh, a, a, what is it, a vest, a safety vest. Right. Um, and then they get into, and then they, something happens, they get the tickets, they get the summonses, they get in trouble, and the company walks away, yep. you know, w without having to worry about the fact that Maybe their summonses is more than two days worth of pay for these people that are in the back of a truck that are off the books maybe. So just wanna really continue to emphasize in whatever we do, that if the companies do right by their drivers, their drivers end up having less moments um, where they're in positions where they're having to pay for summonses uh, or, or deal right. with those. You can't tell me that a driver that's been you know sitting behind the wheel and getting in and out on the stops that's been there for more than, let's say, 11 hours, doesn't essentially become a zombie behind the wheel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think the responsibility of that falls on the company. Imagine yeah, a driver telling the company, look, I'm very tired, I'm gonna just you know, not do these last 200 stops or something. Right. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be fired, they're, they're, it's their livelihoods here. I mean, I know you've seen some of the data that 
DSNY is collected with regard to the commercial waste zone. I mean, some of those routes are absolutely absurd. And, yes. you know, that takes a lot of time to do those routes. And it isn't like they're switching out trucks and drivers and personnel in the middle. There was a one, one route where you needed to go an average of 34 miles an hour for nine hours straight in order to do the entire route yeah. without stopping. Yeah, that's not uh, for it's a, So nine hours, 34 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine these trucks barreling at 34 miles right. an hour in these local streets? And that's nonstop. So it's not like there's a magnet behind the truck and the trash is just getting put in by itself. Mm -hmm. um, so you're thinking that that route was 12, 13, 14 hours. Uh, and they were probably driving a lot slower than 35. It's just, want to just focus, I guess the emphasis here is that uh, corporate responsibility makes it so that the employees end up being more safe and it ends up being better for everyone, but Absolutely. not putting the onus on the workers. Um, I want to have a couple more questions, but I want to allow for uh, my colleagues um, to, to say a few words, and I know uh, Councilmember Vallone has some questions. Councilman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for your work on these bills, long overdue. Uh, Commissioner, I, I thank you for your work, and I, I know we all appreciate when you come to the offices and you inform us, and this is critical for all of us in the city to learn all of the work that's happening and, and how difficult it is to reach certain parts of the workforce. This is a perfect example. These two bills would seem, on the face of it, long overdue, right? You look, you look at intro 1373 and 1368, and, to inform the appropriate state and federal agencies if there's reason to believe and post information on the website. For those that are, are listening in, the, these are the type that should have been done a while ago. No, but we do that. Uh, well, whether you do it or not, we have two bills in front of us that we're, we're now saying to do that. So as council members with the power to legislate, we want to work with our agencies to make sure you have the tools in that toolbox mm -hmm. to do what you need to do and make sure that we don't have to see pieces of legislation that actually look like, well, why the hell haven't we had this before? Why haven't you had the ability? So what I want to give you the opportunity is, is working with Chair Reynoso as to how else can we expand those tools? Is your agency have the ability with the employees that you have? Is this a budgetary item that we need to fight with in the next few months? Is there additional, just like with the Safety Commission and the ways that the Chair are talking about, in a lot of eyes, this is long overdue, and I don't want to come back and tell my constituents or folks, well, we, we kind of touched it, but they didn't have the ability. Plus, I also don't like the federal, state, local scenario, because obviously our hands are tied with federal authorities and state agencies, but we of 8.2 million city residents want to make sure we have the ability to step in and not just hand off but be able to make the violations when necessary, right. where to step in when necessary, take over an investigation when necessary, and also reward the good practices. And I think what Chair was getting into with these contracts, whether we're dealing with parks, libraries, city waste, if you've got a good employer and a good business doing the right thing and taking care of its employees and getting safe trucks on, on the street, there should be an ability to get that contract and those good providers the services so that we can get the best employees that out there. So is there any two things? One is the resource battle, two, the additional tools that we could fight for you, and, and the last would be a good resource track record would you support something like that? So with regard to resources, the thing I want to make sure you're aware of is that in my now almost four and a half years at BIC, when we need resources, City Hall has been very responsive along with OMB. We're going to need additional people. We've already communicated that to OMB with regard to this bill. Um, and I fully expect, you know, just based on my past interactions with them, that we will get that. Um, th that will happen, quite frankly, when the bill is passed. I mean, we're already putting together what our new needs are for this, and we'll be ready to do that. But those discussions with OMB will happen at that time. And I know Chair Reynoso is very interested in getting this through as quickly as possible. So. With regard to the to, and that's where we can help. You know, as council members, that's where we go and to bat for the budget, and we step up and we use these examples as reasons why to give the extended right. resource. Right. So, it. with regard to the the, the um, your other federal, comp, state, local, and then also yes, the federal, state, local. That's in many ways exactly what um, the first part of what I've called the safety bill that we worked out with 
you know, you were on that in those conversations in the summer along with the law department and what that allows us to do by expanding our authority to include safety, we are able to repl replicate in our rules some of the state and federal um, violations, which then allows us to enforce those directly. Right now, in many cases, most cases, what we have to do is wait for either the state or the feds to have a disposition in a case that they brought, and then that's now something that we can use in our licensing decisions. So that, that part of the bill goes directly towards, you know, directly to that, which will, which will go a long way, I think, to um, generating much more accountability in this industry. Well, that's what the chair was insinuating with having the follow-up straight from that commission to make sure that we have following the progress from it to go straight into mm -hmm. legislative or budgetary. Right. And that's important because otherwise it's just another task force, another committee. Right. Do we, do we have any update on, because in many ways, it, examples of what we're doing today, the Century Waste case where the steam, New York City steam fitter was killed and it turned out that truck was just loaded with violations. Do yeah. we have any update on that? We're, work, we're working on that with other, um, I don't want to say anything publicly on that because we're working on that with other agencies. Quite frankly, I'd be happy to sit down with you and off the record, so to speak, tell you what's going on. We're in the middle of it, and that's why I really don't want to do that in a public forum. Um, but other than that, I'm seriously would be happy to sit down with you and explain exactly where we are with that. And it's very much an ongoing. Well, those are the type of high active profile investigation. Exact type of cases that lead. To I don't know if you saw the video of that crash. It's horrifying. It's horrifying. And most everyone out there. Yeah, and that truck was overloaded. And I thank you for that. And, and please keep us updated. Those are the critical cases that unfortunately take the headlines and spur all of us to make, hopefully make it safer for another driver one day. Yeah, I mean, the point is, you know, it's hard enough driving a garbage truck in a crowded city with lots of cyclists and vehicles and bikes. But when you're doing things like overworking your drivers, overloading your trucks, doing stupid things that just make it so much more dangerous, it's, it's like driving around a time bomb on the city streets. It's crazy. Thank you for those updates. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Vallone. And, and related to safety, I just want to say that we, we've, I feel, uh, we have a solution for all this, and it's called waste zoning. Um, it's the way that we're going to be able to hold folks accountable through a city RFP system uh, to the standards that we believe are necessary right. um, to have a safe industry. So while I hear that, I do think that there's going to come a time we're going to have a hearing and we're going to put the safety work and the way zoning work all in one. Um, and I'm looking forward to the time when we finally pass that legislation and right. see how this industry moves uh, forward. Uh, the, the, uh, another question that I guess uh, that, I haven't, that I haven't asked is the resource question. I guess what you're saying is that the administration would like to see this bill passed before it makes a solid commitment related to employees. You know, um, I, wouldn't so, say, yeah. I wouldn't say commitment. Um, Look, I don't know what to tell you other than that they've been very responsive with us. Mm -hmm. So trust me, I'd be the first one screaming because it's my agency right, and I right. wasn't getting what I needed, and that's not the case. All right, so Valone wants this passed next week if we can. Um, so I'm excited about that. Uh, <laughs> so to be, if, if I just want to sum this up, I really want you to stay um, while the testimony of the workers um, is, is put forth. I know you've heard a lot of this testimony one-on-one, -on -one, and um, I've talked to Sean and company, and they've told me about the communication and how that's been increasing. Mm -hmm. So I'm appreciative of that, Commissioner. I really am. But still, would love for you to stay and listen to his testimony. There might be some that you haven't heard yet. So this is what I would say. I'm actually a little under the weather today. So I'm going to stay for like 20 minutes, and then I'm going to watch the rest on TV. But... I want to, again, reiterate, if anybody has information, you know, it has to come directly from the people involved. So we're relying on that, and, and we'll go to you. We'll do everything we can to facilitate making it as easy as possible. But if you have information that we should know, please contact us. It's 212-437-0500. Did everyone get that? Any other question before we commission? <laughs> <laughs>
So, so actually, so Commissioner, I think we're, we're done with the questioning. Um, I appreciate uh, your testimony. I'm, I'm looking forward to passing this as soon as possible. Yeah, great. Um, we've had commitments from Corey, from Council Member, uh, from Speaker Johnson. Um, so I'm excited to see how we can move this forward so we can start getting justice um, for a lot of these, these workers. So thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Uh, we're going to call up the workers now. Um, and their leaders, uh, Sean Campbell from uh, Teamsters Local 813. Rocio Valer Valerio from Align, John Rojas, Anthony Carmona, Manuel Matias, and Don Juan Patterson. Uh, we're going to put a two-minute clock for testimony, but if we feel that there's a need for more, just, you know, you hear the beep go and you're finishing up your testimony, just continue to go on. Um, but we want to make sure we hear from each of you. So uh, how, how should we start, Sean? We start this way out. Sean, you start, and then we'll go down the line. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Campbell, and I'm the president of Teams with Local 813, which represents New York City's private sanitation workers. I'd like to thank you, uh, Councilman Reynoso, and the Sanitation Committee for holding a hearing today. But I also would like to thank the workers, you know, because it's the workers who have been long uh, overburdened with these issues. Workers in this industry face extremely long hours, low pay, and unsafe working conditions. Over the last two decades, private carters have used sham unions and other union busting practices to deny workers their rights to be members of a real union. To hear the employees tell it, the workers had a free choice. We are supposed to believe that workers chose to give up pensions, choose to be paid less, and choose to work longer hours for the same pay. The truth is, Workers didn't have a choice, and now they are stuck with a fake union that is working for the boss. Case in point, back in 2005, the workers at Sanitation Salvage were Teamsters Local 813 members. The company wanted concessions, and the union wouldn't budge. An investigation by ProPublica found that workers were told to sign a piece of paper without knowing that it was that they were signing. The next thing they knew, they were members of Local 124 and didn't have a pension. Their wages were frozen, but anyone who had signed this piece of paper got some cash on the side. All of, all of, all of that, have all of you have read about sanitation salvage over the past year. Off the book workers, underpaid overtime, uncovered, uh, uncovered a death. None of this would have happened if those workers had a legitimate union. This legislation would finally force the sham unions out of the dark and into the light. It will be important complement to the city's uh, commercial waste zone policy, which is essential for driving down the length of routes, increasing recycling, and guaranteeing fair wages and safe jobs for ev even every private sanitation worker. You have a full support in making this legislation now. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, hello. How you doing? Uh, my name is Anthony Carmona. I've been working in private sanitation industry for five years now. I worked for a company called Brooklyn, uh, Viking Sanitation in Brooklyn for two years. Uh, at Viking, I was making 120 a night, regardless of the hours I was working. I wasn't given no safety equipment. I wasn't trained. I wasn't given boots, uniform. I wasn't given anything to work with. Um, when uh, my, my uh, coworkers decided to go union, we talked to eight local 813, 813 Teamsters. Um, but once the boss found out, found out about that, uh, he started giving all of us employees, money, like extra cash on the side, uh, telling us that he's gonna get us a better union that's better than 813 that works for him and works for us. Uh, basically telling us he was gonna take care of us. He was gonna take care of all our problems. He was gonna give us uh, uniforms, boots, everything we needed. Did that ever happen? Nope. Uh, we got rid of 813. Well, my fellow coworkers did, I didn't. And because of, of me being pro-union, the boss decided to cut, cut my hours. He cut my pay. He basically cut my days of work. I was only working two days a week. 
how you how can you survive for two days a week of work? And then you know, so he took everything. He basically took everything away from me. So now I work at our Waste Connections. It's a union company from represented by 813 Teamsters. I make 24 an hour. I work eight hours a week, eight hours a day. If I want overtime, they they give it to me with no problem. You know, they pay me for the overtime. They give me all the equipment I need to work with. I get uniform. They even wash my uniform. It's it's great. <laughs> Tell you, it's a it's it's a, it's a really big difference when you work for a union company and then when when you work for a non-union company. You know, we need we need the city uh, city council and city hall to support the workers in this industry. We thank you for having us here to speak today. I hope you pass this law to protect the workers from fake unions. Please pass this bill and pass the waste zone bill to make sure every sanitation worker has a good and safe paying job. And so everybody gets home safe to their families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Your, your microphone, I don't think, is on. Yeah. Thank you. Got it. OK. Uh, so I first want to thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Rocio Valerio Gonzalez. I'm the director of campaigns at Align. Um, and I want to thank the workers for speaking out today and bringing to light uh, the working conditions in the private carding industry. I also want to thank Council Member Reynoso and uh, Council Member Francisco Moya for introducing this legislation that has the potential to change the lives of thousands of private sanitation workers. On MLK Day, Council Member Donovan Richards wrote in an op-ed that here in New York City, we still see the same struggle that the Memphis sanitation workers faced almost 51 years ago. He wrote, it would be to no surprise to King that most of these workers are black and Latino. Many of the, are also undocumented immigrants or formerly incarcerated individuals, two groups that employ, the employers often see as easier to exploit because they have few, fewer job prospects. Indeed, these are two groups of, that bad employers prey on to fill their pockets. After decades of tough on crime policies and mass incarceration, nearly one in three adults in the U.S. have an arrest or a conviction or conviction record. Nell found that formerly incarcerated men can expect to work nine weeks fewer than non-incarcerated uh, folks and earn up to 40 percent less in wages. Immigrant workers are also particularly vulnerable to wage theft and unsafe working conditions. Bad employers realize these two groups will be reluctant to report violations out of fear of being deported or losing parole. When your livelihood and conditional freedom are at the mercy of bad employers, the results are unsafe working conditions, wage theft, and shoddy representation, if any. Wage theft is indeed a problem for low-wage workers. According to a study for the Economic Policy Industry Institute, wage theft is a nationwide wide epidemic that costs American workers as much as $50 billion a year. This goes hand in hand with what we've heard from the workers today. Workers at Sanitation Salvage reported making $80 per shift and sometimes working as many as 21 hours. This means that the workers were getting paid as little as $3.81 an hour. Let the sink in for a minute. The workers I spoke to reported working at least two years off the books making these wages. This means that if we were to take a conservative estimate and say that the workers had worked on an average 13 hours a day working six days a week, in 2017 they should have made at least $55,484. Instead, they made an average of 24960 And in 2018, when the wages went up, the helpers should have been making at least $65,572 instead of the same $24,960 that they made. The helpers lost about $30,000 in wages in 2017 and about $40,000 in wages in 2018. This is me calculating on an average of 13 hours of, per shift, even though most of the workers reported working up, upwards of 17 hours. This does not include the spread of hours, reporting hours, and any other wage benefits that they should have been entitled to according to their sham union contract, because indeed, they were supposed to be making above minimum wage. The workers at Sanitation Salvage reported having a union, and we know that one of the ways in which we can combat income inequality and abuse in the workplace is through real union representation. But the workers in, the, in, in this industry don't get that benefit either. 
As the case with sanitation salvage, many of these companies avoid dealing with real unions and instead tell their workers to sign a piece of paper telling them that they're not represented by the sham unions. This is what's happening to hundreds of sanit private sanitation workers who are not aware of their rights. These sham unions make it near impossible for us to right wrongs. Allowing the bid to police to better police the sham unions, report wage theft to the proper agencies, and providing education on the rights of workers to organize will go a long way. We at Align see these three pieces of legislation as real progress towards ensuring that workers are protected. However, we must do much more to ensure that these workers are receiving a real second chance. City Council will soon have an opportunity to pass a legislation that must include strong labor and environmental protections through an exclusive waste zone system. Only then can we ensure that low road private carding companies will not undercut good employers and will continue to uplift the rights of workers through real representation. We must be bold and unapologetic and send a clear message to bad employers. If your business model is built on stealing from workers, you have no business operating in the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. That information is, is eye-opening. So I really appreciate you taking the time to really break that down for people so they understand the level of exploitation that's happening to these workers. Hello, good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, council, I would like to honestly thank everyone for being here. Personally, I've been in the sanitation industry for about two years now. Fairly new, but I gained a lot of experience within two years especially at Sanitation Salvage. Here I got Don Juan. His father is 63 years old. I started working with his father. I used to take every little piece of knowledge I was given by his father and run with it. I, it didn't fly in one year and it didn't come out the other. The things he, he used to tell me, I, I didn't expect were gonna happen until I seen it firsthand. I'm gonna tell you on two different accounts. I'm gonna emphasize on, on two different accounts. I got hit by a car working with his father and I come outside the passenger seat and I got hit, I hit by the rear view mirror on my elbow. And it's the beginning of the route. I'm literally two blocks from my house. I could've went home. I didn't call a cop, an officer. The car just kept going. Now me, my work ethic is so on par that I'm gonna get to it regardless. So I, I continue to work. When I got home and I took off my, my jacket, I fractured my elbow and didn't even know. I'm picking up bags throughout the whole night. Listen, if I feel so confident, it was so shortened, the helpers, we didn't have so many helpers sometimes, they telling us we have 80 employees. We never seen 80 employees at the yard, ever. All right, so I'm doing, I can make up my 40 hours within two days, meaning I had to be out there for an average of 20 hours each day. And I'm doing this for six days a week. It was guaranteed that I had to take a nap. Let me tell you this one incident. I'm, I'm picking up a stop across um, in the Bronx, and I got basically chosen to be like picked with because of the, the company I worked for. Now, I got misidentified um, by somebody. I had to run 18 blocks for my life because they tried to kill me. I'm calling my cousin right there. I'm like, yo, where are you, Gordo? Where are you? I need somebody to pick me up. I'm hiding in a corner because I didn't know whether or not to come back out, who to call, or what to do. I'm a newly father, and I'm the only boy and I got four sisters. My pride is strong, I'm gonna work, but I'm not gonna be taken for granted. Now, I'm interning in um, Jumani Williams' office, 45th District. What a small world, right? I got laid off, I worked there, and just seeing how the industry works, politics. This made me want to stand for something even more. I used to not believe, honestly, in this. I guess you got to do it and make it happen for yourself to see the progression. So thank y'all, really, make this happen. Not for me, not for the money, for safety. For the future, for the future uh, of New York. I'm talking about, I used to be on the truck, sleeping. I used to sleep in the back of the truck. I never did this in my life, sleeping, holding in City Island, almost dying. I watched his father s sleep. Nearly, he, he had to take an hour, it was mandatory, just to pick up garbage. Just think about that one. Thank y'all. Thank you for your testimony, I appreciate it. Thank you. 
How y'all doing? I'm Don Juan Patterson. I worked for Senator Sawa for 17 years. So, like, I've been there through it all. Like, I started off $60 a day. Mm. I worked 12 hours. I went up. I got an 813. Then they made us sign a paper saying that we don't sign it, you're going to be fired. Mm -hmm. So we all signed the paper in, like, 2005. Then we went down from 20 some dollars to like, like $500 a week. It didn't matter how many hours we worked, no matter what we did, it didn't matter. If we didn't do it, you fired. Go home, see you tomorrow. Then uh, I think that was 2008, they got a clock in there. You sign it one time, they sign you out another one. Sure. Your time was getting changed, your hours coming up short. What that was, 08. I was in an accident. The truck flipped over in Hugs Point. Mm. But we got out though, but we young, we was courageous. So we just went back, tried to go back to work. But mm -hmm. I went to the hospital and I was like, yo, my back hurt. They was like, oh, you gonna come back to work. Paint containers or sure. do something, just do anything. Just don't go on workers comp. So I said, forget it, I went to workers comp. I ain't get my workers comp. I was out from February to like June. They was fighting the workers' comp the whole time. Like, I ain't getting nothing. I think I got my money in August. It, it just was bad over there. And a lot of guys, like, people don't realize, we young, we, some people got felonies, some people didn't graduate high school. So to make $600 a week, that's fairly normal to some people. But he's probably making this amount, X, Y, Z, they changing out. Yeah, they did us dirty. And we said, young guys, we tried to get the union, tried to get one away, we tried to get 813. But if you do it, you get fired. You get fired. Everybody. They fired what? 20, whole shop. 20 some people in less than two weeks. Because they found out we was trying to get 813. Like, it, it, we ain't had no choice in the matter. It was like, you either fucking stay here or you, you out of here. I mean, like, it hurt. Like, to think now that they stopped you from doing something. We got kids, we got family. Now we got no pension. Mm -hmm. Y'all started 401k in like 2008. That money short. We all, we got nothing now. Now it's either you gotta go back to work or try to pursue something else. If you ain't got the education to pursue nothing else, then you just, you know what I mean? Like, and then for them the last day we there working, they don't even have the DC to call us and say, yo, listen, we're gonna shut down the shop. No more work, no nothing. Everybody getting ready to go to work. Somebody that was got a business across the street from the shop called us and said, yo, your company talk about no more. We like, no more. Call the supervisor, nobody answered. Call the bosses, nobody answered. Call the office, nobody answered. The union, we called them when the first 30 days happened, they changed their number and sent us a letter. Saying, yo, y'all you Medicaid, y'all benefit, everything cut off. We got nothing. We like, huh? How? But just like they said that when we went to court, when Sawyer went to court, they said we had, somebody was supposed to compensate us for the two weeks. We got nothing. We didn't even know we were supposed to go on unemployment. We, we about to go back. We think we going back to work. Nobody called us and told us. We had to find somebody else to tell us, like, yo, y'all know y'all company working back, huh? But we sitting at home calling people, nobody answered nothing. Like, it, it was bad, man. Like, a lot of guys, it was bad, man. Some people don't know where to go, because like he said, other companies, they really didn't like us. They think it's us. We just trying to make a living. So if my boss taking all y'all stuff, what that got to do with me? But they want to fight. It, it was bad for us, man. Like, a lot of young guys, man, really lost hope, man, and make you don't want to work for nobody. Trust nobody. Because we've been here all these years fighting for y'all, trying to make a living, to be honest, not to be in jail, not to do the dumb stuff that going in the street at night. We out there 17, 18 hours. I went out there one day at 6 o'clock. I ain't get home to 3 in the afternoon. You ain't hear me cry, came to work the next day. What, I had two hours to go home, change my clothes, take a shower, go right back to work at 6 o'clock. We was there, like, and I, don't under I just don't understand them. Like, we tried, man. We tried hard, baby. Everybody. It's people that ain't here today. That, that, it's, it's bad, man. They did people dirty, yo. You know what I mean? For them to be the people that they are, we thought they was, give us a Christmas party, take the Christmas party from us, 
and bring all these people. We don't know these people. We don't have no business around none of these people. These are not our friends. It's supposed to be for us. We used to get a Christmas bonus. They took that. Oh, y'all y'all want to go to the union? Took the Christmas bonus. Giving y'all nothing. Nobody. You got guys there that was there eight and ten years making like $600 a week. Drivers bring home 800 You ask another company, they bring home this money, that money. You like, huh? Every time, I mean, every time we went for another union, people would just start getting fired, so everybody else just fall back. Like, I ain't, I ain't messing with that, right? They losing their job. You don't want to switch. You done been too long. Look again. We went to the union. We asked them about the, um, what was that, the pension? Mm -hmm. No pension. No pension. Six years, no retro pay. Oh y'all, y'all, oh y'all don't get that. We give y'all a raise. You got guys making what 13, 13, 25 a week. No retro pay. How you give us our money? We've been uh, we y'all was taking money out of our check every week for three years straight. I asked a guy from the union, I think his name, what's his name? Andrew? Andrew. I asked Andrew, I said, how could you make a suggestion and a deal with the boss to paint and clean his office? But you can't make a deal for us to get more money. Guys making, huh? Guys making 13. Went up to what? 16. 16. The guys making 16 went to 17. How's that a raise? Like they. I could, I could tell, like, I don't want to stop you from speaking. I could tell that this is, is very personal for you. And, and I could hear, like, the pain and, and what you guys went through. And this is important for people to know what you went through for us to be able to find solutions and have enough people to have our backs when we're trying to push legislation like this to affect change. I'm gonna ask you guys some questions after the last test of testimony. Hold on, hold on, so. I'm sorry. Before you begin, sorry. Yo guys, I was doing 85 hours a week for two years. I'm, I'm not sure, honestly, I don't know about any of y'all. I don't, I don't know that many people that work that hard. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Manuel Matias. Uh, I started working at Sanitation Salvage when I was 17 years old. I uh, started getting paid $65 a night. I was working 18 to 20 something hour shifts. Uh, my days off, I would sleep the same amount of hours at work in one day. I literally had no life. Um, I worked for Sanitation Salvage off the books for about five years straight under the same pay. I was the first person to go into sanitation salvage. I start earlier. Everybody who started at six, I started at five. And I was the last one in the shop. Um, for me to get on the books, to get a hourly rate, it was still nothing because I was only, I was working maybe 100 plus hours and I was only getting paid for 50. For me to get on the books, I had to literally let a container full, a full when we had the, the recycling, we had recycling, it was all full of food. A container that weighs maybe a ton, it fell in my hand, crushed all my fingers. Literally, I had to go on the surgery to get my whole hand reconstructed. When I went to the shop to complain about the, about the accident, the owner of the company, Andrew Scuteri, literally cursed me out. Called me a dumb mother. <laughs> Continue everything you can imagine. You know, uh, I was young. I didn't know what to do. Um, there was no workers' comp. Uh, they, had a, they did a whole lot of illegal paperwork there to get me workers' compensation. Oh, workers' compensation was only like two, three hundred dollars a week. I was out for I don't know how long. Um, when I come back with a broken hand, they put me to paint containers. Sixty hours outside, summertime, in the hot ass sun, just painting. Okay. Second incident. Um, I worked for salvage a lot of years. I had to deal with a lot of knuckleheads. You know, they're men, people off the streets. 
um, drunks, drug addicts. Um, whoever wanted to work, that's the ones they put in, you know? Um, one night I had a helper. I don't know if he was under the influence or what, but I got sexually harassed and molested while working a 16 hour shift. Throughout the whole 16 hours, I'm either getting verbally abused or harassed or whatever by this individual. I made multiple complaints to the supervisors, to the owners of the companies, and once again, the owner of the company, Andrew Scutiri, I complained to him about the incident. Again, with his reckless mouth, I get verbally abused for a complaint. Um, nothing was done that day. Andrew Scutiri, the owner of the company, a multimillionaire, and again to my face, and literally shoved me and wanted to fight me just because I complained up about an incident that happened at the company. And his thing was, your mother, get going. What, you want an easy pay? No. All I want is to work in a regular environment and continue my job, you know, continue my day. Um, the Scuteri's family, very, very nasty people. They all for themselves. They didn't care nothing about safety. They didn't care about the employees. All they cared was about their pockets. When, literally, when we started working for them, they were nothing. Nothing. In less than a decade, these people went from nothing to billionaires. They are billionaires. They was making over hundreds of millions of dollars a year, quietly, without nobody knowing. I knew personally stops like Parchester. The whole condominiums of Parchester was paying them maybe a quarter to half a million just for one stop. One stop that would load up four trucks. And, only one truck. and that was only one and that was only one stop. God said four trucks, but only one truck doing it. Exactly. So it was I mean it's more than fifteen I got close to fifteen years working for these people. It's a lot of stories. I mean it's a lot of pain and it's sad to say that it's twenty nineteen and you know now is that people is hearing us because we didn't have no backup. We didn't, we didn't know who, 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 who we, we, we complained to the fake unions. They didn't do nothing. You call, who are you? Who are you again? They don't even know who the hell we were. Well, not to cut you off. We, we used to do on the average holiday when everybody was at home that Sunday. 60 tons. 60 tons, 50 one tons, night, one truck. One route, 60 That's tons. his, he on the truck, I'm on the truck, and he on the truck. 50 tons. People dumping their truck one time. We're going, going four. Times. First Three, load, four. 22 tons. You know, it's funny. So I just want to say a couple crazy. of things. Your stories. So you're talking about all these tonnage, and most of these people don't, don't even know, know that, what, 50 tons, 60 tons even mean something. Is that a lot? Is that a little? The, dr the drivers obviously know. But you got 60 tons. That's all garbage, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's 18, I think it's like 15 or 20 tons of cardboard. That's one truck. That's equivalent to 50 tons of garbage. That truck got to go back out and do it again. Guys, so, I, now, I want y'all to talk. But we re very careful because we it's a we got to make sure that we allow for other people to testify as well. Okay. But I want and I want to ask you questions so that we could get to like uh, um, like relevant relevant uh, like uh, Life 890 and these these unions that didn't do you justice and like the role they played. Um, was there ever any moment in your job where there was anything posted about what rights you had as as workers. Can I say something else? Yeah. All the years I worked in sanitation salvage, I never had medical insurance. I never had no dental insurance. I never had anything. I got so many hospital what, what, bills. What they, what they gave us. It's not even funny. They like the us. fake insurance they gave us, uh we'll go to the hospital and they'll they laugh. Know. They'll laugh. They don't even know who, who, who. it's hilarious. 
turn your mic on. Make sure your mic is on. Yeah, I, I have. I've never um, personally seen it. I was. It was verbally, if anything. Like what I've seen with this company is that when you limit the communication between management and staff, there's a lot of misconstrued. There's a lot of just bare false everything. So we don't know what we're able to do, what we're not. We know what we're not able to do, because that's what they constantly remind us of. So that that's goes as far as our rights. So we so, just so you, so you know, we, your story. Are any of you working right now outside of the internship? Are any of you? I, 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 I even go back. I don't even see my job. I ain't gonna lie. I'm still working at the garbage. I'm working like. Are you working with a company? What companies are you are you working? With? PSI? Okay. And you just don't want to go back to garbage? No, nah, I'm going to go back, but... Make sure your mic is on when you, when you testify. Now, I said you can't work like that or try to go to school or do anything, work too many hours, 15, 16 hours. Mm -hmm. By the time you get home and go to sleep, you trying to get back up, it ain't going to work. Something, something ain't going to get done. Then you got kids, go to school. So I just want to make sure that you know, we're, we're definitely moving forward. Unfortunately, you guys had to, to bear the brunt of, you know, sanitation salvages, work practices, uh, for us to get to a place where we're going to be able to find justice for people in the future. When we pass these bills, and we will pass these bills, uh, we'll be able to investigate these unions that are not real. We'll be able to let workers know what their rights truly are. Um, and uh, pay more attention to what happened to you. And I just want to say, in this political arena, in the politics of it all, um, there were a lot of blind and deaf people to your cause uh, because of the connections that they had with your bosses. Um, but, you know, as politics progresses, like everything else, um, some people don't care about your bosses. They care about you. Uh, and moving forward, I think that that's what, what we're going to be doing, making sure that you um, and people that work in your industry have the respect and are represented by unions that are actually going to be good for the company and good for the workers. Um, not this way, where the company was terrible, the workers were being treated like, like trash. Um, so we're looking to, to deal with all that. So I just want to know, I want you to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel here um, for, for the future. And I really appreciate your time and the testimony that you have here. Um, and I'm glad that people got an opportunity to listen to it because I think a lot of folks as well, I want to say, don't know your perspective and don't know what you're going through. They're saying, oh, maybe it's tough. Maybe it's okay. Yeah, we know it's long hours, but they don't understand how bad it is. And they need to listen to it. If not, I can't do my job here appropriately. So I appreciate your testimony and your time. So thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman uh, Ray, yeah. so if I may, I will say that, as you said uh, earlier, there are some good companies out there, and I would like to recognize Waste Connections and Action Carding because they have stepped up. They have said to us, listen, we are willing to hire any of these folks. And I know Don Juan probably close to 20 years now. He will tell you, when I used to represent um, Sanitation Salvage, I was a pit bull. And that's one of the reasons why they didn't want 813 over there, because we did the right thing by these guys. Mm -hmm. And they made sure that they, you know, got the guys, convinced them. And, and again, that's why I said I applaud these guys for even coming forward Thank today because see. we would, even right now, with all that has gone on, we have guys who have moved away from Sanitation Savage, who have gone to work for other companies and are still afraid to come forward mm -hmm. and tell their stories. So that's how bad it is in this industry. And once again, I applaud you and this entire committee for doing everything that they're doing, not just with this bill, but the way zoning, but everything. This industry as a whole needs major, major reform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I just so, wanted to say one more thing, too, that what he was saying about people afraid, which is mean, like, you afraid to talk against them because they might know the other bosses. Mm. So if they know the other bosses, guess what? When you go there, you get no work. Oh, that's we not hiring. That's, no that's, yeah. that's, that's the reason why we still in sanitation salvage, too. That's the reason why we still in sanitation salvage, too. Because they told us nobody went high and we, go, and we uh, quit. Nah. The owner of the company, Stevie Scuteri, sent out a memo to all the garbage companies that if anybody from sanitation salvage will go apply, don't hire them. Don't hire them. Waste management, nobody. all of them. ISI, ISI everybody. And everybody. So nobody wouldn't leave. Nobody wouldn't leave. It didn't matter who we were. It didn't matter how many years of experience License, we had. License didn't matter. Help it didn't matter. 
Now matter, they we went would under, not get higher. Not we everybody went higher. higher. But we're gonna we're working against that. So I, just to be honest, to let you know that A13 is actually working with like Waste Connections and 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 with Action and with Action to try to see if we could place some people there. Um, you know they have a limited amount of spots, right, to, to to do this work. But they're trying to find opportunities for you for the sanitation salvage workers. I think Bic is also working on that to help. So if you're interested in those opportunities, just let um, A13 know. And we'll, we'll do our best to help that transition happen. It's not 100%. We can't give everybody, like, it's not guaranteed. But we're going to try our best to place you with people that we think uh, are doing good work in the industry or people that need you. Because it's not easy finding drivers um, and helpers for this industry. And I think they know that. So there's people trying to do, do right by you. Now, I want to talk about, um, as, dri as a driver, <laughs> when it comes to the waste uh, industry, uh, authority Authority is really abusing us for what's going on. Um, police right now are stopping every sanitation driver and just hammering us with 10, 15, 20 tickets, violations under our name. Uh, them tickets go under our name. It's like, a, it's like a report card. Every time we get stopped, you know, I look like a bad driver. I'm like the best driver in New York, I could say. And, you know, it's not fair. Paying tickets, paying lawyers. Um, we, so, we, and we talked about that with the administration about yeah. they wanted to do enforcement of sanitation workers because of all the crashes and the things that were happening and the people that ended up getting the brunt of that were the drivers, not the companies. The companies came out winning and all that and the drivers were the ones that were suffering but now every the, 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 sim, the summonses. Not every driver is bad, you know. You know but not every, not every driver is bad. We should have. Yeah, I get that. But we, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to cut you, you short. Know, you short you but we. But it's not the end. This is not the end. And remember that the big commissioner said, if you have any more information, you could give them that. They'll sit and talk to it, to it. So make sure you take that number down, and you follow up with them. But I really appreciate your time, and I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I think we should also pay attention to mental health awareness. That is very important. We need that. Like, they actually do need that, sanitation workers. Eduardo Lassen, uh, Alex Amante, Pedro Garcia, and Alan Henry. All right. So we're gonna to try to keep on clock now um, as best as we can, just because we have uh, two more panels. So uh, we're gonna start from this side down now. So, um, go ahead. Yeah, you should start. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the council for uh, allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Alan Henry. I'm a 30-year uh, plus work of the private sanitation industry, and now I'm an organizer for the uh, Teamsters Union. Uh, I'm gonna get right into it. We're gonna play a game today, but there's nothing funny about this game. Uh, imagine if sanitation salvage workers made $22.12 an hour. Imagine if sanitation salvage drivers made $22.43 an hour. Imagine if sanitation salvage workers had a pension Imagine if they had a severance plan. Imagine if they was off nine holidays a year. Imagine if they also had their birthday. Imagine if they had four personal days off. Imagine if they paid zero out their pocket for health care and they had great health care. Well, guess what? They used to have that because the Teamsters represented them. This is 17 years ago. This is what they had 17 years ago. You want to know what, what they have now? As of 2018, the helper that made $22.12 an hour 
was at 1350. The driver that made 17 years ago, $22.43 an hour in 2018, he made $22. The pension plan that they had 17 years ago is gone. The severance plan they had 17 years ago is gone. The nine holidays they had is gone. The birthday they had is gone. The personal days, most of them are gone. The health insurance as of 2018 for single coverage was $585 a month. For a family was $1,040 a month. As of 2019, uh, the sham union contract says new higher helpers will get paid $15 an hour. Uh, as of January 1st, which is minimum wage. So we always talk about how powerful unions are. Well, here we are, the independent union. That's how powerful they are. They was able to reduce wages and reduce a middle-class middle, middle class job to nothing. Here's, a, here's what a sham union contract looked like. A couple of pages. Here's, here's a Teamster contract. Uh, it's 42 pages. Teams to, teams to contract signatures from the company, signatures from the, the president of the local. Here go a sham union contract. And, and, and I see this all over the city, not just at Sanitation Salvage. This is what you see when you ask a worker for a contract. The union signed it. Where's the boss signing it? A blank signature. I and these workers would like to believe that things like this exist because of the right people don't know about it. I look at this council as the right people. It's time for change. Enough is enough. We heard, we heard horrible stories from these workers, but look how good they had it. Look how good they had it. Something has to be done. Thank you, and I know you guys and, and, and ladies will do your job. Thank you, Alan, appreciate your testimony. Hello. Hi, right, guys, my name is Pedro Garcia. I worked at Sanitation Salvage for two and a half years, getting paid the minimum of $80 a night, no matter what hour shifts I worked. As long as I knew I figured I had a job tomorrow, I was working the whole night through. When you're 18, 19, a young, young kid like me, like a lot of us from Salvage, you just want a job. We just want to work. Right now, it just really just freaking, it just opened up my eyes that, that 17 years ago, I had way better benefits. I was, 17 years ago, I was four years old, five, five years old. And like now, I'm not even making damn near half of a union contract. That working all these long shifts, having injuries, nobody to back me up. All we wanted was just jobs to work. We just have the protection, have people that we could call to help us out. And we never had that for, for two and a half years. Me personally, me, I'm young. Everybody looks at me, I got a baby face. <laughs> Real little, I had the heaviest route in salvage. I have a picture with all my stops. I have 1,400 stops. At exact number, 1,393. Exact, I have it on my phone to show you guys. That was my heaviest route, just so I could make sure I have a job every day. Working six days a week, drivers wouldn't stay. And so me as a helper, I gotta train new men every night. Nobody will come to work. They'll quit the same day, causing me to work longer hours. Companies would never compensate, try to help out drivers to make them stay. Just made it hard on the helpers, just you gotta come in. I don't feel comfortable work, working with people I don't know. Nobody do. Yeah, I work with people at night who are under the influence I could tell they haven't slept, but we all got jobs to do. We all got families. Where so for me personally, two and a half years of seeing a sham union really drag us through the dirt, I would love to see a, br a brand new union and see them take care of all these sham unions. Have all this, because honestly, there's too many of us that went through it. My buddy Manny and me, me and him, we used to figure out to take naps together sometimes to just try to get through the night. Man. And that's just, one, that's just one example. Me and him, just, just to get through the night. If, th if there's no extra help, we, do t we have to do 20 tons within 15 hours. If not, they'll start complaining, calling us, telling us a customer is missed, missed calls, and I have to do 1,300 stops plus a night. 
working with just one guy. And that's just my that's just my story. I worked through injuries. I just wanted a job, guys. To be honest, I'm not here to complain about work. I'm here because I was not given my rights. Every time I called, I got sent to a voicemail. Every time I told them, hey, how about you give me a little raise as I'm working this crazy route for you guys. They said, oh, just go read your union contract. I got no protection there. So I just hope that with all this hearing, everybody here, that the, the Teamster 8, um, 813 will definitely have, will definitely just have, um, have our backs now to just keep on moving forward and get rid of all these sham unions. Because honestly, I don't want to see this happen to nobody. I'm about to be 22 in two weeks. I don't want to see another kid 19 going through the same thing I went through. It's hard, man. You just want a job, and <laughs> the first person that says yes, and you just, you just go with it. It's terrible, man. So right. I just hope every, everybody keeps going forward, yep. and everybody gets back whatever they're old, and this don't happen to nobody else, man. It hurts. It's hard. Well, thank you for your testimony. I hear you. Um, and it's unfortunate, but I hear you, and thank you for, for testifying today. Hello, my name is Alex Lamonte. I started working at Sanitation Salvage when I was 16. I was a troublemaker when I was a kid, so that was a way of me getting out. Now, they took advantage of that because of me not knowing of how much I'm supposed to get paid, what's the, the protocols that's supposed to be taken. When I started going out, it was a snowstorm. December 26th, when I was 16, when I started working, because I didn't get nothing for Christmas. The person that was supposed to be in charge of the route left me. They didn't call nobody else to come out and help me. I did that by myself with the same driver I was working with now as 28, Warren. All we had to do was go out there, finish it, and pick up the garbage. Now, when they gave, when the paperwork that they gave the Congress, that they gave us safety protocols, all they did was have somebody come in with a bunch of paperwork, let us run the can run quick, and run this. Anything that y'all ran down and asked them about, they hurried up and had us sign quick paperwork just to make it seem like they actually did something. None of the trucks was put together. Look as big as I am. I had a mild stroke at my job. And all I was worrying about doing is going back to work. I got kids to feed. They didn't care about that. You call and say you sick, they tell you, oh, Johnny's gonna have a problem with that. The company's gonna have a problem with that. Oh, you don't got nobody to cover. And you'd be like, Buddha, I just got home at three o'clock. He didn't care about any of that. All it was, pick up this garbage. We need it picked up by any means necessary. The reason no other company wanted to hire us, our company say sanitation salvage. All the other company called us sanitation savages. Because the amount of time we had to do this route and how many stops we did. None of us are supermen, but we all out there doing 1,500 stops, 60 tons of garbage. And then not, and nobody is giving us compensation for nothing. Nobody's telling us to come in. And then when the union comes so-called to help us out and speak to us, all they do is bring us food from the local Spanish restaurant or pizza to shut us up or McDonald's. And that's totally not right. We all got kids. And if we don't stand for something, we fall for anything. And I just want to thank y'all for actually listening to that. Thank you. I appreciate the testimony. How you doing? My name is Eduardo Leeson. I've been working for Sanitation Salvage for like two years. I remember my first time working there, Manny. He told me the first time I got there that they, they wasn't shit. <laughs> Sorry for my language, but I just brushed it off and ain't really paying no mind, but working there, they used to really treat us like that. I done worked days and nights in the rain, snow, fingers frozen, couldn't even feel my legs. Had to get the job done. That's all they wanted. Job done, job done. And then days that I messed up my back, I done had a driver drive me into a container one night because he was so tired. All they wanted was for us to come to work. And then days I had to come in the work engine to show them that I couldn't come work. Why should I have to do that? I should tell you out my mouth and you should believe me as a man. Feel me? And then days that I, they took me off a light route and put me on a heavy route just because that, that second man needed help. They ain't care about me. They ain't care about when I got injured. All they wanted me to do was come into work, and I was messed up. But um, what I find what I find messed up is that the union, they came, gave us paperwork to fill out, and the most they ever gave us was a T-shirt. Ever since then, we used to call them. They give us to run around like everybody else said all the time, run around, run around, run around. 
to the point where we just I just stopped calling them myself. When we when we lost the job, I went in like another another regular day thinking I might go get my paycheck, work, no trucks is out. Supervisor come out, oh, there's no no work, no pay. I'm like, how is no pay? I didn't just bust my ass for a week, six days, barely got sleep, having to wake up and rush to work because I'm waking up late because I ain't getting on, enough sleep. It was messed up, but I hope, I hope that y'all do y'all job as y'all say y'all gonna do and, and fight for our rights for what we need as a worker and as a human being. I appreciate your testimony. Do any of you guys work right now um, or working in the sanitation industry? To be honest, I ain't even rushing back into the sanitation just because of the simple fact of what happened. Right. Uh, I work, but I work local one, staging. That's what I do now. It's like he said, I've been doing it for so long, my body can't take it. And I just got my body out of not being used to going to garbage. Because you sit there and you get in trouble for something, they give you a week off. You think your body recuperating. No, your body wants to go out there and be on the back of the truck, and that's not normal. So now that I'm not feeling that way, that I need to go out there and fling all this garbage and do all this movement, I'm not going back and putting myself through that. And I'm happy that the city made that law that nobody has to ride on the back of the stairs. Windsurfing, that's the worst thing you can do to anybody because the driver's going 40 miles an hour. He's not trying to make you fly off that truck purposely, but we got 1,500 stops to pick up. So everybody's doing their best just to please this company and they not pleasing nobody but they self. I work for Royal Waste right now. That's another eight, um, freaking, another 813 un um, union involved. They, they, they opened up the door about three weeks after that salvage got closed down. I was, I was applying everywhere, applied at Waste Connections, Action. Everybody told me that they got no space for helpers right now. But Royal opened up the doors for me. So right, so right now I'm still working for the for the waster of you know for the um, for the sanitation field. I like it for right now. I don't know nothing else to be honest, guys. Like I said, I've been doing this. I was 18. All I know is garbage right now. So, like for me personally, having that and like it, I feel great now that I left one bad company. Now I went to a good company. Now you guys are all starting to fight for my rights. So. Do you feel okay? It was they taking care of you in Royal? Is that different? It's like, it's like you're taking a horse <laughs> from a freaking, from, from a broken down farm and you brought him to a freaking <laughs> nice, happy track race. I feel good now. <laughs> I got clothes. The guys give me gloves, hats. I never had a Carhartt hat from a job. <laughs> Carhartt's a good brand. It's winter out here in Salvage. I had to work with freaking three sweaters, two shirts, four pants. <laughs> now, now these guys give me, you know, they give me gloves, coats, sweaters. I'm glad. There. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I wanted to add on what he said too. Also, is that we did work in bad conditions a lot. We did. It is, an, it is nice that we done went out with no heat in our truck. Bro, none of the trucks had. Heat. None of the trucks. Only the new trucks had. Heat. The only way they we was able. The only way we was able to stay warm was run, <laughs> run, and run, and keep fast. running as fast as you can, so your body could just generate heat to keep warm. And you guys are all under under 30, all of you. I'm yeah. 30. I'm, I'm only, 29. I'm only yeah. 19. You're only 19. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, the level of exploitation that's happening by sanitation salvage is like, it's so shocking. Um, you know, they take advantage of, you know, young men of color, immigrants, just anybody that they could get their hands on. It just didn't matter to them. They didn't discriminate when it came to who they, who they take advantage of. No, so No, they listen to your stories because they ask you when you're young, oh, what brought you here? So you, they, they feel your hurt and they manipulate that. Most of us is trying not to get in trouble, not, not, not trying to be arrested, not trying to have to do this so we got a couple of dollars and you see an opportunity. All right, sanitation, you're supposed to make money. So I'm going to do what I got to do. All right, you start me off the books, but then you keep me like that? You make me feel like a modern day, like I'm a slave. Not trying to make it seem like that, but it's like I'm a modern day slave. I'm working for salvage. I was married to garbage. I got three kids, two boys, seven and eight years old, and they hardly know me because my wife and my family was a garbage truck. That's a sad part. I, I, I would like to say one thing uh, before, real quick. And, you know, what we have to realize, another problem that this independent union creates is 
you know, we got the issue with the, the, the locations where they are, but now you got the good companies that you have to go negotiate a contract with. So now, how do you negotiate a contract with a good company that wants to do the right thing, but they're, they're paying their workers $28 an hour. How can they compete with a company like Salvage and a lot of other companies in the industry that's paying their workers so low, that's robbing their workers? Their workers is dealing with wage theft. They don't buy their workers uniforms, gloves, boots. How, how can the good company compete? So now, the, the independent union is hurting those workers and they're hurting the whole entire industry because you, the, the good companies, you cannot get the wages up. And, they, and, and these companies, has a, they have a legitimate beef. How can I compete with this guy? And the answer is they can't compete with this guy because this guy is not doing the right thing by their workers. So we have to keep that in mind. It, 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 it hurts the whole industry the companies that want to do the right thing. So, you know, I, listen, I take this dare and I take this real personal. Uh, I started back in this industry when I was 16 years old and I was making $14 and change an hour as a Teamster back in 1985. I was making more back then than these, these workers started making close to 30 years later. My son started in this industry about seven years ago. He started at $11 and change. How does that happen? How was I making more money than him 30-something years ago? H how does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. Criminality, uh, collusion, corruption. So, you know, I want to see something done here, and I'm sure you, you, you know, I'm sure the council's going to do their job, but listen, these, store, these, are, I look, these are kids. And it's, it's, what we hear today, there's stories throughout this whole industry like this. And it's being done to kids, and it's being done to black, and mostly Hispanic kids. So, like I said, I know we're over time. You know, I expect, you know, and, and these workers expect that this problem existed so long because the right people didn't know about it. Now that the right people know about it, we, we expect change. Right. Thank you for having me. Uh, absolutely, and I appreciate it. Again, I appreciate your testimony, and thank you for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Shangaris, Kendall Christensen, and Zach Steinberg. So you guys can start from either either end of the table or the middle. <laughs> it's three, so go ahead. Steve? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, my name is Steve Changaris. I'm not going to read the testimony. I just want to go over the key points in it. I uh, work for the National Waste and Recycling Association in the New York City chapter. Um, we wanted to point out in the testimony that we've been supportive of good changes that have come to New York City in the world of waste and recycling uh, legislation and regulation. We've supported Local Law 42. We've even supported the bike um, safety guards. We've supported organics. We've done a lot of good work in this space to help move um, the safety and environmental programs of New York City. Uh, and based on that kind of a record, it shouldn't come as a great surprise to you that we're here today supporting these bills. Um, the member companies understand the full effect of uh, the BIC disclosure reporting requirement system. Um, we know it's worked well for the waste industry in terms of the fitness and integrity of the companies that work in New York City, but we have no reason to believe that it wouldn't be good for the labor unions, particularly for the employees of those labor unions if uh, or as these problems uh, uh, are out there. So we think uh, if the BIC can go back and take a hard look, what's going on in there, they can use that information to help improve the standards and lower the volume here and start healing some of the problems that you, you, you hear about. 
Um, so that's the first case. We believe in the disclosure. We think the program will work for the labor unions. Second, in terms of reporting the violations, I, I you know, there's a, sometimes there's a lot of public debate about two Americas or three Americas, maybe 15 Americas, depending on who you listen to. But I believe in the enforcement of the rule of law, and I just cannot say that if anyone that is harmed by someone not, again, my, what my members have taught me over time is that, you know, they work hard to run a good company. They pay their people well. They good. They have good trucks. They have good uh, relations with their communities. That, that's we're a, we're, we're a significant industry, a very large national industry where everywhere around the country we provide a vital service. My, my, the members that inform me don't cotton to someone. It's not rational. You can't have someone else in the marketplace violating the rules. It distorts everything like the last speaker said. We agree with that from a level playing field. We believe in choice and competition. We believe in, you know, the marketplace is the solution to a lot of our problems, but you have to abide by the rules and regulations. And if that, this new level of VIC oversight, when they're looking at a company's books and operations, if they discover wage and hour violations, and if they're talking to employees and they're there, we totally endorse the BIC working with the other agents, the alphabet agencies, as you were, as it will, to go out and get to get the bad operators. That'll level the playing field, and you know that helps us as companies, but it also helps the employees and our businesses run better. And the last point is about the the information. Um, um, it just makes common sense uh, if. People have rights uh, and employers, uh, if the city, uh, again, we believe most of our folks, if you go to their message boards, they're going to have their rights pretty much disclaimed and up there already. They're going to have websites. But to the extent that someone's not doing that, we totally ag agree that, w that whether it's up on the, you know, again, we're, we're moving into the 21st century here, so it doesn't always have to be on a, you know, a posted on a board or something, a website, some action, some, some place where the employee can actually get the information is really key and important. So we have to keep in mind, even submitting the testimony today, it would be nice to hit a send button and do it electronically, but we like written copies here. So we are moving. We believe in this stuff. We're on the bills. We encourage them to do it. And the last two points I'd like to make is that the Commissioner Brownell noted it in our testimony. We definitely talk about the resources. If the City Council and your committee and the City Council are going to task the BIC to do this work, that they really ought to uh, give them the additional resources to do it. Uh, they do an excellent job when they dig in, and these disclosure reviews are intense, intense efforts. The other thing is that we're also want to use the opportunity. The BIC has a, a biennial rate cap process. We want to use this opportunity to have the BIC speed that up this year. The kinds of things that you want to see and the city wants to see this industry do costs money. They're expense drivers, as I noted in the legislation. And we'd encourage that rate cap process to begin so that we can make our case to help try to bring that up so that we can hire the guys at better rates, we can b have better equipment, and we can be better uh, corporate citizens and, you know, make some of this kind of um, situation settle down and become more normal. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Can I ask a couple of questions? The, the rate cap situation. Um, so, so I agree that rate raising the rate cap or not even having one could mean that, you know, the cook companies that we are- We really like you're not having one, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> I know, I know you would. My, my, my main thing is uh, it's gonna be a cost on businesses and, uh, and folks that say are, that are against like way zoning are gonna make a big case that this is bad for small businesses uh, because they don't wanna rate, because it'll be more expensive. Um, and for me, what I see it is that the expense is going to go to not having companies like this do their work. Um, and it's an argument that I'm gonna make, and I just feel that uh, you, the industry right now is playing it both ways. I, um, and, and I hope when the conversation happens that you know the expense on businesses isn't the focal point um, of any challenge to reforms that we're trying to make, and more towards having a standard, an increased standard across the board that is, that is responsible. Um, and then the second thing is, does anyone in uh, NWRA, is that, do any of them have Life 890 or 1245 or these unions that we call sham unions as, as unions within that association? I, um, I can't speak definitively to that, but mm -hmm. I think as a, one of the things that you have to learn about it or understand about a trade association is that, you know, as long as they're licensed to operate in a city, 
or in a jurisdiction or however that local uh, government or agency operates mm -hmm. the solid waste system, uh, they're free to participate in a trade association. I can tell you uh, the, 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 the way I look at that, the people who inform my decisions, the people who control the organization in terms of membership and leadership, believe that this is a business to be here tomorrow, mm -hmm. that we have a corporate responsibility to be good actors, to treat our uh, environment fairly, to treat our employees fairly, and to do all the kinds of things that, that you're concerned about. And on the issue of, 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 of an open and free competitive rate, that's the way the American marketplace does it. The, 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 in, in many analyses of the current rate cap system, it's a legacy of the old world yeah. when there was a lot of illegal corruption activity going on. With, that, yeah. with, the, with the competitive nature of the market, the cost of service should be the cost of service. And the, you know, it, again, if anyone's abusing that service, there should be oversight and companies should be, just like wage rates, if someone is stealing a laborer's wage rates, we should, that should be addressed. We want that enforced because too many of the other companies in the industry pay that properly and do the, the right stuff by their employees. So yeah. we, in, we, we want to see that enforced and we want to see active oversight there and good industry compliance. I hear you. I, I think you. A, a rate floor makes more sense than a rate cap, but um, a, well, that'll be another a, a, a conversation. Is, we've, we've argued that in some places as well. I hear you, but a conversation for another day. I think the big thing here is that, you know, some of these businesses have gone off the rails. This is not like a, 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 a minor incident. This is a complete culture of, you know, of, of madness in sanitation salvage and, um, you know, I, I didn't know the extent of it. I think today opened my eyes to more of the problems. So I'm just saying, I, I hope, I'm, I'm grateful that you're standing with us on these pieces of legislation and that as we continue to do this, that we, we continue to partner for, for the greater good here. Um, and the workers have to be a part of that in a real way. But thank you for your testimony. Kendall? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and members of the committee. I'm uh, Kendall Christensen. I serve as executive director of New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management, which is a consortium of locally owned and operated waste service companies, all of which are licensed and regulated by the BIC. Uh, uh, you have a statement for me. It's brief. Uh, I will largely say ditto to what my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Shangiris, uh, just uh, discussed with you. Uh, I would make the following points. Um, that first of all, uh, New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management is generally supportive of the three intros before the committee today. They propose to leverage BIC's existing regulatory and oversight capacity with respect to this industry. Uh, to a large extent, they reflect the, the current practices of the approximately 30 companies that together provide more than 90% of the city's commercial waste and recycling related services. Those companies operate professionally and comply with a wide range of general laws and industry-specific regulations that include worker protections, fair compensation, and good benefits, including unions chosen by their employees. Um, but we support these intros because they also make the broader point that issues of immediate concern regarding the waste services industry can be readily uh, and effectively addressed by the existing regulatory system operated by BIC without the city having to resort to the extreme risky and untested concept of creating geographic zones and selecting just a few companies to provide services in each zone. Uh, that system would not be fully implemented in, until at least 2024, five years from now. No reason to wait until then, but to take advantage of BIC's existing capabilities now. Um, that approaches the basis for intro 996 introduced by your colleague, Councilmember Cornegie. It addresses the same goals, but does so sooner, better, and cheaper. It opens with a section outlining a driver certification initiative focused on enhancing industry safety and proceeds to sections addressing route efficiency, waste diversion, and other matters, including employee protections. It directs BIC to convene a task force to update uh, BIC's 20 years worth of regulations, which has been successful in achieving their goals of promoting choice and competition, high levels of customer service, and cost-effective pricing and supporting the city's environmental goals related to commercial recycling and organics diversion as well. Uh, we recently saw your counterparts on the San Diego City Council making a similar determination to work within its existing open market licensing system for commercial waste providers uh, and in rejecting a zone franchise system uh, such as that adopted by their neighbors in LA. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to testify. I look forward to further conversations with you about these issues.
Thank you. And I just want to ask you the same question. Just do any of the companies that are within your association have these sham unions or these fake unions that are, that I, I believe hurt the, the good companies that are doing the good work? Um, I can't speak to uh, individual companies and won't do that in the same way that um, uh, Steve uh, indicated, but I would say that the research we did a few years ago indicated that about 60% of employees in this industry are represented by one of the four or five unions that operate within it. Yeah, so that's a yes, oh, I guess. But, but from both of you guys, I just want to encourage you that there should be some type of accountability. I always, call, I always say this with this industry. It just doesn't seem to be any like legitimate self-policing. And it's almost like you guys just walk around like, you know, yeah, we got some bad guys and we let them hang with us all the time. There has to be a time when you could just say, you know what, the good guys, we appreciate the work you do. You bad guys, we're just going to abandon you. We're going to turn our, we're going to turn our backs on people that are like messing up the industry or giving you a bad name and so forth. I'm just, I, if I go to the list of your organizations or all the businesses that you have, I guarantee some of them have these unions that are doing a disservice to the greater good and the good players. Um, so I just want to put it on you a little bit that, you know, like do, do your job so that we don't, so I don't need to continue to pass legislation that you fight me on. And these, I, I'm happy that you're on the same page with me, but I wouldn't have to do that if there was some better self-policing. Uh, that's all. I just think you should do your, your part. Um, Rebney? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Zach Steinberg, and I'm the Vice President of the Real Estate Board of New York. Rebney supports this committee's efforts to better protect workers in the private waste hauling industry and ensure that employers in this industry comply with all workplace health, safety, and wage laws. The well-documented failures by some firms in this industry that was highlighted by the testimony today is of great concern and definitely warrants your action. For this reason, Rebney supports legislation that would empower BIC with greater authority over the private waste hauling industry, including the measures under consideration today, and we support their efforts to fill gaps in existing city law. Rebney believes these bills provide an important foundation for additional legislation to enhance BIC's authority to further protect workers while also accomplishing the city's goals of reducing congestion and truck traffic and improving public health. Specifically, we encourage the committee to enact Intro 996, which would enhance BIC's authority in other key ways, including through improving worker safety by requiring BIC to standardize safety certifications and mandating employers provide actual training, reducing pollution by giving BIC the authority to establish emissions limits for collection vehicles and encourage improved route design to reduce vehicle miles and the horrors we heard about earlier, increasing BIC's ability to better utilize technology to improve industry operations, which Rebney hopes would include utilizing GPS technology to track vehicles and encourage more efficient routes, and also enhancing publicly available data information about the industry. These enhancements, along with the authority provided in the legislation considering today, would be a forceful way for the council to address the very real concerns about shortcomings in the regulation of the private waste hauling industry. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony. We have our last panel coming up. Uh, Melissa, M Melissa Iken, Ishan, Eric Goldstein, I still can't get it right, Percy Gaines, Calvin Andrews, and Alexis Robinson. I still can't get it. Right. And we're going to start from the left to my left to the right, so you can go ahead and start. Make sure that the mic is on. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Calvin Andrews. I've been working for 767 for eight years now. I started in 2011. and 2012, I got on the books, but I worked a whole year off the books and receiving $80 a night. But um, 2013, I also had got injured, smashed between a truck and a train station pole as well have a lump in my chest. You know what I'm saying? Um, I've been out of work for like two weeks. I went back to work immediately because I had a baby mom that was five months pregnant, so I couldn't stay home, but they never gave me no co commission, no pay, no nothing. So I had to go back to work right away after I held up. You know what I'm saying? So as far as my story, I know everything else, but I've been there eight years. Are you working for another company right now? No, nah, not at all. Okay, are you, are you looking to work for another company? No. Nope. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Well, I appreciate your time and your testimony. I really do. Thank all you. Right, thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Percy Gaines. I've been with the company since 2008. I worked on the books for three years. And from there, they put me on the payroll. When they put me on the payroll, I work a flat salary. The route I had was in Manhattan. I start 11 o'clock at night, and I get off 6 in the afternoon the following day. Get to my house and do the same thing all the next day for six days a week. And we basically been out there working all in my house, not getting sleep. I'll come home and see my kids for two or three hours, and I'll go right back and do the whole thing all over again. And it's like, instead of taking care of us, they did us wrong. And you got to put a stop to it. But they're going to keep on treating people wrong. Uh, other companies will do the same thing right now. Right now, the place I'm at, I better go home and see my family. So I'm, I'm glad that y'all going to put a stop to this. I appreciate it. What company do you work for now? I work for Royal Way Service. Oh, all right, you too. Okay, and it's uh, it's night and day the the way they treat people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, the place I'm at now, they treat you with respect. Right. They take care of you. But the other place I was at, I start my route 11 o'clock at night, and I get off two, three o'clock, sometimes five in the afternoon. I see people go to work, they come home, and I'm still on that truck, and to turn around to my house two hours later, I'm back out the door again. And I did for several years. They don't respect us. They never cared about us. You get hurt, they don't care about that. You go file for un un unemployment, they won't threaten to fire you. So it's like it was no win situation with them. They put your back against the wall and they didn't care. And it hurt it. It hurt it a lot. I went through a lot of problems with them. I lost a lot messing with them. August of this year, they shut down. August this, from now, from August to now, I'm still trying to catch up with my bills. They didn't, they didn't call us to tell us nothing. They didn't think about helping us, but we stick our backs out for them. And I don't think it was fair. Thank you again for your testimony. I appreciate it. You are. Hey, how you doing? My name is Alexis Robertson. I was working for Salvage for three years. I was two years off the books, getting paid $80 a night. And I just got on the books like a year ago. And, like, honestly, like, we used to work hard, you know, day and night, you know, same thing he was saying, you know, we was just, it was times that we used to be on the truck all day, and we see people that we just seen them go home, and then we still on the truck, and they come, going back to work, and we still on the truck, you know, busting sweat and tears for them, you know, and it was a hard company to deal with, you know, they used to, honestly, used to threaten us, you know, if we, if we was, we was doing almost like 80 out, eight, like 80 hours a week. And, you know, sometimes we used to tell them, like, you know, we tired, you know? And it was times that I used to be on trucks with drivers that used to nod off on the truck. Like, I'm in the back holding off my life, and this driver just nod off, hit a car, and I'm in the back. Thank God. Like, times I used to just jump off quick. And, you know, when I started noticing that, I used to just tell certain drivers, like, you know, just pull over, like, you know, take a little nap, you know, I'll probably be safe, and let's get hurt, you know? But, you know, there's a few times they used to just not really care for us. They used to just want their job to be done and never make sure we was okay or nothing. Did you, do you, are you still working in the industry? I was still working with them, but when they, like, I, before they closed, I got into an argument with one of the supervisor about, because I ended up getting hurt on my back because I had a slick disc, and I was telling him that I was hurt, but he honestly didn't really care about that. He just said, don't come back. We'll, we'll, we'll call you when we want to, like, so it was just like, wow, like, you know, and I've been out of work since August. It's going like six months with no work. I just, before I got here, I just came from um, Avid Company. I just tried to get a, um, I just filled out the application. They just told me coming today to interview me and all that. And I was just sitting there hoping that they hired me. They just told me they're going to call me back next week or something. Well, good luck for that. And I appreciate, again, your testimony. It looks like, you know, they took advantage of a lot of young people and, and made it very difficult for you. But we're, we're paying attention and... You know, the, what you see in Royal is going to be more of the norm as opposed to what we saw in Sanitation Salvage because of your voices and the work that you did. I want to be clear that all the Sanitation Salvage people that are speaking today, it's because of your voices that this even ha started and how it's going to end. Um, so thank you for standing up, and I really appreciate you, all your testimony and you taking the time of your day to come over here to try to make a difference, and you, you will see a difference. And I'm looking forward to when we sign this bill, of you all being up there um, getting pens from the mayor uh, because you deserve to be there, all right? Okay, hard act to follow.
Yes. My name is Melissa Yashan, and I'm a senior staff attorney in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. NILPI has advocated and litigated for environmental justice in New York City for more than two decades. NILPI's Environmental Justice Program has long focused on the detrimental effects of the city's commercial waste system, and I have worked in the area of waste regulation for five years. NILPI is a member of the Transform Don't Trash NYC, a coalition of labor, community and environmental groups advocating for fundamental reform of the broken commercial waste system. NILPI strongly supports the bills being heard before the Sanitation Committee today as an important step towards holding private hauling companies accountable for their labor practices, safety practices, and the unreasonably long hours and routes required of drivers and helpers in this dangerous industry. We once again laud Chair Reynoso for his leadership and vision in introducing two of these three important bills and the entire Sanitation Committee for giving time and space to hear what the workers in this industry have to say today, for their voices have for far too long been silenced. These three bills are a stark reminder of how corruption and organized crime continue to be a part of the reality in the commercial waste industry, despite three decades of work by the Business Integrity Commission. Intro 1329 in particular serves to close what has been a loophole in BIC's oversight authority, which has allowed individuals with ties to organized crime to continue to work in the trade waste industry as officers of sham unions notorious for cutting sweetheart deals with employers while doing little to represent workers who perform dangerous and often exploitative work every night. As ProPublica has reported, sham unions with long histories of corruption are in place at several private hauling companies with troubled safety records and multiple allegations of wage theft by workers. The employers with sham unions are also those most vocally opposed to the reform of the industry, going so far as to form their own industry association, which apparently is still in existence, called New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management. Because all three of these bills would increase BIC's ability and mandate to protect workers, NILPI fully supports them. But while these bills are an essential first step towards ridding this industry of sham unions, protecting vulnerable workers and improving working conditions, without rigorous and full enforcement, they will not be enough to alter the dangerous inefficiency and race to the bottom atmosphere of the private carding system. Currently, despite the fact that the Commission has vast authority to make findings of lack of good character, honesty, and integrity based on everything from the submission of an untruthful document to owing back taxes, more often than not, the Commission simply resolves violations of existing laws with settlements rather than making a full finding of a lack of good character, honesty, and integrity. Further, there is ample evidence that the already existing record keeping and reporting requirements for trade waste haulers are violated routinely, for example, with off the books, off the books workers. And although haulers are rarely issued serious violations or denials for this behavior, even when they have potential potentially serious implications. Even with the adoption and enforcement of the important bills being heard today, the commercial waste industry remains in dire need of fundamental reform. Only the new incentives and increased enforcement leverage enabled by the upcoming transition to a zoned commercial waste system will ensure that waste companies adopt safer, more efficient, and environmentally sound operating practices. Under the zone system, the city will execute long-term contracts with a hauler or haulers selected to serve each commercial district, giving BIC and DSNY much greater leverage to negotiate and enforce safety, environmental, and equity standards. In conclusion, NILPI enthusiastically supports Intro 1329, Intro 1368, and Intro 1373, and we look forward to continuing to work with BIC, DSNY, and the Mayor's Office and City Council to ensure that the upcoming zoning plan truly implements the holistic reforms that are necessary to make this industry safe for all its workers and everyone on our streets. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso. Uh, today's hearing really does belong to the workers and their testimony was moving and powerful. My name is Eric Goldstein. I'm uh, the New York City Environment Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. As you know, NRDC is a national nonprofit legal and scientific organization active on a wide range of environmental health, natural resource protection, and quality of life issues internationally, nationally, and right here in New York City. It might seem surprising at first for a national environmental group to be coming out to support legislation aimed at securing and protecting the rights of sanitation workers, but it shouldn't be. We can't be said to be protecting New York City's environment if we disregard the mistreatment of workers who collect the commercial waste that New Yorkers generate. On the eve of the 50th anniversary of the birth of the modern environmental movement, we know that environmental protection and social justice must go hand in hand. 
ensuring that private sanitation workers are given basic information on working conditions, are fairly paid for their time on the job, and are represented by labor unions that meet at least minimum standards of good conduct are rights that are fundamental to a just and equitable waste collection system. It's important to note that uh, some private sanitation workers are being treated fairly by their employers, but all sanitation deservers, uh, workers deserve these basic human rights. For these reasons, NRDC strongly supports intros 1329, 1368, and 1373. Passage of these three sensible progressive bills will mark an important step forward in enhancing the commercial waste industry in the city. We thank you, Chairman Reynoso, for your tenacious leadership on these and related issues, and we know that we can count on you, on Speaker Johnson and your colleagues in the Council to keep the momentum for reform going and to propel commercial waste zoning further later this year. Thank you again for holding this important hearing and for moving this legislation. Thank you, I appreciate NRDC's uh, testimony. I just wanna thank everyone again who stood to the end here, uh, listening to all the testimony of the workers. Uh, I'm very excited to close this hearing because after this, the next hearing would be a hearing uh, for a, a vote on the committee and then it would move to a full vote. There's something I'm gonna be demanding of the speaker that we move as fast as possible. And, I'm ex uh, and these stories brought into more perspective um, how many changes we need to make in this industry. We knew it was bad, but every time we hear another voice, a new voice from the workers, it gets worse. Um, so we got a lot of work to do. Um, so we're gonna conclude this hearing and move forward with change. Thank you, uh, and the meeting's adjourned. Thank you.